Good morning. Uh, it's really good to be back here. I actually have to keep my phone here just in case the Maryland Health Department decides to call me because do the Ebola checks. Because uh, if they call me and, and they can't get me for two hours, they're going to go to my house, and we don't want that. <laughs> um, but it's, it's really good to be back in, in, in Washington. Um, I see a lot of uh, my friends here. I went to the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University, and some of my classmates are still uh, here. Some of, and then Mr. Cashin. Mr. Cashin is a very important figure in my being here today. When I was first recruited as a Scott Fellow um, and offered the job, I t turned it down because uh, I, I wasn't ready to go home. And uh, about a week later, he called me and said, look, we don't usually do this. <laughs> But we think it would be a good fit for you to go back home, and I'm, I think it's one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life. Um, very happy to be here this morning. <clears throat> First, on behalf of my president and my people, I just wanted to say how grateful we are to the government and people of the United States. It is in, when I was here in September, the conditions back home were different, markedly different from what they look like today. People were dying outside Ebola treatment units because there were no beds. Today, the Ebola treatment units are operating at about 10%. Um, and the US response was so big and so unprecedented, I think it spurred the rest of the world to respond as they did. And uh, we also thank, I mean, most times the, the credit goes to the president, right? Because he's uh, head of the government. But the US Congress has been there bipartisan for the Liberian people. And for that, we're very, very grateful. So. Uh, around that time, the president wrote a direct appeal to President Obama and uh, shared that letter with members of Congress and, and president, uh, the Minister of Defense was here and he said at the time that Ebola posed a threat to the very existence to our state. And I, I, it was, he wasn't being, um, <clears throat> he wasn't exaggerating. And uh, what happened after, again, is recognition of, of, of U.S. leadership and, and Again, we're, we're grateful for that. Where are we today? Um, things are much better today in Liberia than they were. Like I said, uh, we there are nine counties that have had no cases for the past 27 to 29 days. Um, there are six counties now where we're still having cases, and those cases, at least four of those counties, are being infected by Monrovia, by the capital. 56% of the new confirmed cases are in the capital. And now we're going two days, three days a week with zero confirmed cases. Um, so we'll have an Ebola treatment unit with capacity for 100 beds, and they will have four cases, two confirmed. And that's what it's like around the county. Every now and then, we get seven infected, 19 infected. And that is because it is very, very difficult to get people to stop ritual and traditional practices that in unwittingly serve to, to advance the disease. And so people. In places where there haven't been infections, people are still uh, doing the ritual preparation of bodies, and that is, in effect, uh, causing more family members and people to get infected. And uh, Monro like I said, Monrovia is infecting the, the outlying counties because so if I get sick in Monrovia, then the family says, no, it's not uh, Ebola. It's three plus malaria. It's typhoid. And then they take him to the village. And then the people who care for him in the village get sick, and then we, we go in. But we're on the new campaign now, there's no new cases. Uh, we said no new cases by the end of the year, but the last day of the year, there were no new cases in the country, even though that's not what we meant. Um, we're hopefully in, an, in this quarter, in this first quarter, to, to, to end Ebola in Liberia. Unfortunately for us, we're gonna live with Ebola for, for the foreseeable future. The, the disease has an animal host. If it were just a human host, then with the death of the last victim, the disease would be over, but we can't wipe out all the animals in Liberia. So like Uganda, like the DRC, we're gonna have future recurrences of, of, of the disease. But I doubt Ebola will ever claim as many lives as it did again. First, a big part of that was just ignorance of the disease. We had never experienced this in West Africa at the scale we did. And, and initially, nobody knew what to do about this disease. And patients presenting uh, uh, symptoms that resembled malaria and typhoid and, and loss of fever, stuff we're used to. And so, Going forward, Ebola is going to be one of the things that our health system checks for when a person comes to the hospital sick. Going forward now, 
what next? Liberia after Ebola. I have some ideas and I hope I can share them with you today. First, initially we had thought that um, when we got to the day where there were zero cases throughout the whole country, like no Ebola patients in all of Liberia, then we could begin the economic recovery. That is impractical and that is not gonna happen. Um, the economic recovery has to begin now. Ebola has just completely wrecked our economy. Uh, we were projected to grow about 5.4, 5.5% this year. The last uh, projection they did was uh, uh, the Ministry of Finance working with the IMF was uh, minus 0 0.4. Uh, this is tragic for a country where before Ebola, more than 80% of the people lived on less than $2 a day. You can imagine what it's like now with livelihoods cut off because of that. The economic recovery cannot wait. And the economic recovery will have to be centered on the private sector, without question, um, because that's the only way the economic recovery will be sustainable. And on that, we, we have some ideas too. But in terms of Liberia after Ebola, the first and foremost thing we have to do is to rebuild our health system. And the tragedy will be for the health system that su succeeds the Ebola epidemic to be weaker or worse than the one that Ebola destroyed. So the, the health system has to be resilient. Um, we, we, and there is a plan. After the genocide in Rwanda, the uh, Clinton Health Initiative worked with the Rwandan government to develop this seven-year plan. There's a consortium of 26 American medical colleges and universities that provide um, on a rotating basis, basis faculty at Rwandan health um, medical schools to train Rwandan doctors and nurses. We've developed a sim the similar plan for Liberia. Right now, it's about $270 million, and it's for 10 years, and it's, it, the intent is to rebuild the, the health sector, beginning first, just think of it as a pyramid, and at the bottom of the pyramid are community health workers, and to train about 25,000 of them. These are the people who are the first line of defense. Someone gets sick in the village, this is the person to go to. And uh, Last Mile Health and Dr. Paul Farmer's group are working with us on that. At the second level will be nurses. And uh, I think it's around 8,000 nurses that are gonna be trained. And then above the nurses, we have doctors, but generalists, and then at the tip of the pyramid are uh, specialists. So this, pro this project, uh, this program is being developed by the uh, Ministry of Health. It also includes uh, building uh, the Tottenham National Institute for Medical Arts, that's where nurses and physicians and assistants are, are trained, and then the, the medical schools at the different colleges, at the different universities, especially the University of Liberia. We're also trying to establish the same partnership with about 26 to 30 US medical colleges, medical schools, so that again, on a rotating basis, they have uh, medical staff, uh, um, instructors in country training Liberians to be able to do that. So that's in terms of the, the, the health system. Um, and now that we're talking about the health system, I can talk about my signature program, which is Roads to Health. And I would like to use, uh, uh, there's a hospital in Liberia called the Jackson F. Doe Hospital. It's in um, north central Liberia, Tapita. And it's, it's a quintessential illustration of the problem with our health system in Liberia. It costs $10 million to build. It has over 171 different kinds of medical equipment, including the country's first and only CT scan and they're actually bringing now an MRI. They have specialists from Egypt working there and from China and Liberians working there. So compared to anything um, in that part of the country, in the whole country, in that part of Guinea and Ivory Coast, this is a state-of-the-art hospital. Unfortunately for us, this hospital is not having the effect that it should. Six to eight months out of the year, is raining in Liberia, torrential rains. 90% of the roads in Liberia are unpaved. And in the middle of the rain, it is impossible to access this hospital. So you can have a state-of-the-art facility that is not very useful to the people it should be benefiting because they don't have physical access to this. So as we build a health system after Ebola, we can build health centers all across the country where they weren't before but we have to build a health system that functions in the rainy season. And if to do that, then physical access has to be considered as part of the health infrastructure. And so in Roads to Health, next week, uh, actually they might do it before I get there, although I'll be upset if they did before I get there. Uh, the Ministry of Public Works will be rolling out the first phase of Roads to Health. And, and, uh, and we're beginning with Monrovia. 
like I said, about 56% of the new cases have been, uh, are coming from Monrovia, and they're from overcrowded communities. Because Monrovia was essentially built for about 350,000 people. Now it has about 1.5 million people. So people live in these crowded communities with no egress or very little egress or ingress. And so I sent out uh, four teams of 12 engineers into all of those communities to do an assessment of the conditions of the road. And we're going to do And so it makes it easier. If ambulances have to go into communities to evacuate people, the, the, the riding surface will be better. And in the rains, it will remain accessible for them to be able to do that. Because Ebola is transmitted through contact with body fluids of sick people, we want professionals evacuating sick people. And that's why. And the, the, the Roads to Health is a multi-year program. Um, it takes a second tier of roads. Because initially, for our agenda for transformation, we had selected the main corridors that we wanted to develop. But Ebola, of course, exposed weaknesses in that. And so there's a second tier of roads that will ensure access to health facilities year round. We also have to talk about power. We worked with the MCC and we did a constraints analysis for Liberia. What are the two, what is the binding constraint to economic growth in the country? And we found there were two roads and power. If, if Liberia's economy is to recover, something has to be done about power. Let me just give you an example. The president did an op-ed where she said that on game day, the Dallas Cowboys stadium uses more electricity than Liberia has in installed capacity, and that's true. And this year, we have about 22 megawatts of installed capacity, the 22 one megawatt generators, the kind you find behind big hotels, so that when something happens, they turn them on. Well, this year, we should have phased out some of them. About 12 of them were given to us by USAID. And these generators weren't meant to be the primary source of power. So they, they, they're ready to be. But because of Ebola, we were trying to build um, heavy fuel oil uh, generation capacity. But all of that has stopped because of Ebola. And again, we have to come back to Liberia's weather. When we lose the dry season, we've lost a full year. Because it's only in the dry season that we can do any substantive construction work. And so we've lost at least 15 to 18 months already in Liberia. <clears throat> So there's roads, there's the health system, there's roads, the, there's power. And then we have to focus on the private sector. Currently in Liberia, most of the invest investment is in agriculture, mining, especially iron ore mining. But anybody who's been following commodities prices knows that there's been a huge dip in the price of iron ore. All our economic projections were done with the intent that our iron ore companies will be expanding. But even they now, have to curtail their ambitions, and that has implications for our fiscal uh, uh, condition. And so here's a suggestion of what we could do in terms of the aid that comes to li Liberia as a response to Ebola. Maybe Liberia can offer some of these companies a tax break, a tax incentive. Well, the monies we would have collected in revenues from them from taxes were monies that would have gone to pay teachers, pay doctors and nurses last year, when we had issues with collecting money, USAID gave $5 million to help cover the salaries of health workers. And so if we give the tax incentive to these companies so that the private sector remains viable in Liberia, then what we lose in that can be made up for in terms of what comes to the country, whether it's to support uh, uh, education or to support health. It's just an idea <laughs> um, on, on, what, on what we can do uh, with that. I also wanted to talk about <clears throat> accountability. Obviously, one of the things that people want to know about, and, and every time you open a newspaper in Liberia or listen to the radio in Liberia, there's somebody on the radio uh, talking about corruption, and I think that's a good thing. I think uh, one of the things that uh, President Sirleaf's administration has done has opened up the country for people to be able to talk about corruption all the time. So obviously, it seems like this administration is more corrupt than the ones that came before it. I think it's just because of the sunlight, people can talk more about corruption now without fear of being arrested or jailed or worse. And uh, a, few, uh, a few months ago, I wrote an, uh, uh, a, a piece responding to some w um, bloggers who do health reporting. And Amanda helped me and, and, and published that on the Glo Center for Global Re uh, um, Center for Global Development uh, website. 
I'm saying all this to say that first, in terms of accountability, there's a lot of money going into Liberia right now for Ebola, um, and hundreds of millions of dollars. And at some point, somebody has to account for this money. The government of Liberia, I think it should be very clear that money is coming to Liberia for Ebola are not coming to the government of Liberia. The monies coming for Ebola are going to WHO, MSF, um, WFP, and they have to account for that money. The Minister of Finance has requested every institution and entity in Liberia responding to Ebola to give an account of how much they've received, what they've used it for, so that we can be able to publish that. OMIR, the newest UN, UN agency that was established to fight Ebola, is supposed to create a platform for everybody to be able to publish on there what they're doing with monies coming to Liberia. The reason this is important is this. Two years from now, some blogger is going to write an article and say, this is a country that receives three from four billion dollars in aid, and look, look what they've, and technically, they're correct, but that's devious. Right? Because the money is not actually coming, it's not actually coming to Liberia. And in terms of Ebola response, the infrastructure to respond to Ebola does not translate into permanent structures. Most of them, they're tents. We can actually, it's going to be very difficult to imagine a more permanent use for what we're doing in terms of responding to Ebola. And so what we can do, though, is to, to marry Ebola response with our regular health system so that we can make the transition easily. And so the president has insisted that these things call. So in the Ebola, I, I'm, I'm going to close shortly, but in the Ebola response, they have a forward logistic basis. When material comes into the country at the port, like, you know, PPEs and chlorine and, and drugs and whatever it takes to fight Ebola, they are taken into five warehouses, you can call them. These are the forward logistic bases. And the country has. Um, 15 counties, so each uh, FLB manages uh, um, uh, uh, three counties, right? Three times five? Yes, okay. <laughs> um, and uh, the whole point is that these five logistic bases will become future sites of national, we have a national drug services that supplies public hospitals. So these sites will become the future sites of regional depots for the national drug service. That way we can transition from, from an Ebola response to regular health. The president has also insisted that there's a second stage called community care centers. And community care centers are basically isolation places. If someone gets sick and we don't know if it's typhoid, malaria, or Ebola, we take the person away from their family and put them in a CCC. They take a sample of the blood and send it to the lab. If it turns out that the person has Ebola, the person is sent to an Ebola treatment unit. If the person simply has malaria, they're sent to a regular hospital. And the president insisted that the CCCs be of more permanent structures and they be built next to Ebola treatment units, next to hospitals, so that they can in the future be used for triage. Um, hopefully, that, that will be something that stays um, um, after Ebola. But when a country goes through what we've gone through, first there was the war, then there was the second war, that's Ebola. Um, it is impossible for the country to remain the way it was before. And so a lot of things would change in Liberia. Um, you know, here, when, I, when I'm in the US, I have to get used to shaking people's hands again. In Liberia, we just bump uh, uh, <laughs> like, like this, and, and, and that's become normal now. Without, without, yeah. and, and so uh, even in how we, we grieve, how we, we take care of the sick, all of that is going to change. And as Liberia changes, I believe that our partners should also change. And I have a couple of comments for our friends at the World Bank, the African Development Bank. One of the biggest industries in Liberia is road construction. I'm Minister of Public Works. And uh, I was just saying to, to Nancy that the credit to GDP ratio, which measures the commercial banks lending to the private sector is around 20% in Liberia. In the US, I think it's around 168 to 200%. You want that number to be high because it is a reflection of the activity happening in the private sector. Almost half of that is commercial banks lending to construction companies. Uh, Mr. Cashin owns one of those commercial banks uh, uh, in, in Liberia. But the way the pre-qualification criteria are written for World Bank projects, it makes it absolutely impossible for a local firm to ever participate in a World Bank. For example, they might ask for 75 to 100 million in annual turnover. If you pull all of the 
construction companies in Liberia together, I doubt they have 10 million, let alone 100 million. But this is what happened. Almost all of the partner-funded projects in the country came to a halt with Ebola because every one of them is done by an expat com company, and they invoked force majeure and fled the country. Now, if those projects were designed so at least 20 to 30 percent of the works were subcontracted to a local firm, some works would have continued because the locals didn't have anywhere to go. Even up to today, it's difficult to start the projects. The, uh, the Chinese companies are coming back, but some of them, the monitoring consultants, are from New Zealand and South Africa, and those countries have uh, restrictions on travel, and so the monitoring consultant cannot come, and we have to wait until they come for these projects to go forward. As we be similarly, I would like to say, just as Ebola revealed weaknesses in our systems that need to change, they have exposed weaknesses in the international system in how these programs are managed, and those programs also have to change. Thank you.